This is the Standing Committee on Health, and I'm Trevor Boudreau, the MLA for Richmond and Chair of the Committee today. Um, as, as, as committee members can see, um, Ms. Ms. Painter isn't here yet, although I do see someone in the, in the lobby. Um, oh, perfect timing. Perfect time. I was just going to ask committee if we were okay to, to begin, but uh, Ms. Painter is here, so, so we will. Um, today we will hear from witnesses regarding access to birth control and sexual health services. And I think uh, it's probably timely given that April is Sexual Assault Awareness Month, so good timing for, for this uh, committee um, topic. Well, I would ask everybody here to please turn off your phones or put them on silent. Uh, in case of an emergency, you would please exit through the back door on Granville Street, walk down the hill towards Hollis, and gather in the courtyard of the Art Gallery of Nova Scotia. I would ask everyone to please keep your masks on during the meeting unless you're speaking. Apparently, as chair, I am ex the exception to this rule, but I will put my mask on uh, as well. Um, I will ask committee members now to introduce themselves for the record by stating their name and constituency, starting with Ms. Lewilla. Good morning, everyone. I'm Susan LeBlanc, the MLA for Dartmouth North. Good morning. It's Kendra Coombs, Cape Breton Centre, Whitney Pier. Good morning, Laura Lee Nickel, MLA Coal Harbour Dartmouth. Good morning, Rafa Di Costanzo, MLA for Clayton Park West. Good morning, everyone. Thanks for being here. I'm Kent Smith. I'm the MLA for the Eastern Shore. Good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm Chris Palmer, MLA from Kings West. Good morning. Thanks for joining us. I'm John White, uh, MLA for Glace Bay and Dominion. Good morning, everyone. My name is Danielle Barkus. I am MLA for Chester St. Margaret's. Thank, thank you, committee members. And for the purpose of Hansard, I will also recognize the presence of Legislative Council Gordon Hebb and Legislative Committee Clerk Judy Cavanaugh. As I mentioned earlier, the topic today is access to birth control and sexual health services. And we have a number of witnesses. Um, I'm going to get the witnesses to introduce themselves, uh, starting with Deputy Minister Legasse. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Good morning, everyone. Janine Lagasse, Deputy Minister of Health and Wellness. Ms. Penny. Good morning. Tanya Penny, Senior Executive Director of Clinical Portfolio at Department of Health and Wellness. Ms. Oldfield. Good morning. Karen Oldfield, Interim CEO at Nova Scotia Health Authority. Dr. Hatchett. Hi, thanks. Uh, Todd Hatchett. I'm a medical microbiologist and infectious disease physician uh, and oversee uh, STI, the STI clinic at the QE2, and I'm a uh, service chief for microbiology for the Central Zone. Ms. Painter. Good morning, Martha Painter. I'm the chair of Wellness Within, an organization for health and justice. I'm a registered nurse working in abortion, and I have a research program at Dalhousie School of Nursing looking at the intersection of reproductive health and the criminal justice system. Dr. Brooks. Uh, Melissa Brooks, obstetrician gynecologist at the IWK Health Centre. I'm also um, co-medical director of the Nova Scotia Women's Choice Clinic and I'm an abortion provider there. I'm also the co-medical director of the reproductive care program of Nova Scotia. Max Hyde. Hi, I'm Lee Hyde. I'm provincial coordinator for Sexual Health Nova Scotia, which is a community-based nonprofit. Thank you to everyone, uh, a number of witnesses today. We will get into um, our, our questioning in just a minute, but first we'll actually have uh, a number of our witnesses give opening statements, and I'll begin with uh, Deputy Minister Lagasse. Good morning, Mr. Chair and members of the committee. Thank you for the opportunity to be with you today. On behalf of Ms. Penny and myself, we are pleased to be here in attendance with representatives of the NSHA, IWK, Wellness Within and Sexual Health Nova Scotia to answer your questions on access to birth control and sexual health services. We know this is an important subject that touches the lives of individuals, couples and families. It is a subject that encompasses a broad range of initiatives, programs and services. I know that we will touch upon many important topics throughout our discussion this morning. However, before we get to that discussion, I would like to take a few minutes to tell you about some of the existing initiatives, programs and services, and some changes coming as, as it relates to sexual health for Nova Scotians. Although the announcement for Nova Scotia's health care plan is pending, I can say that a goal of government, the department, and our service delivery partners is to transform health care in our province, addressing long-standing barriers to good health be it physical, mental, or sexual health, or just the overall well-being of Nova Scotians. Work to reduce barriers is something that has been underway for some time, but we know we can always do more. 
we are currently reviewing our policy on gender-affirming care. We are committed to working with the 2S LGBTQ plus community to identify and remove any barriers we can without compromising best practice care. The Nova Scotia Family Pharmacare Program and the Department of Community Services Pharmacare Benefits Program both help reduce the cost and increase access to prescription contraceptive products. Since 2020, Nova Scotians have had access at no charge to pharmacy contraception management services through their local pharmacy. This service helps people make an informed decision on which contraceptive is right for them and allows the pharmacist to prescribe it. This is just one example of the important role pharmacists play in supporting good health and access to care. During the pandemic, it was necessary for our health system to temp temporarily reduce some services at various stages. Unfortunately, sexual health care services were not immune to reduced services at various times. However, the pandemic has made us adopt and look at different ways of working. This led to service improvements like the case in the case of STI testing that will continue. I am sure our partners at the NSHA will have more to say about that. Lastly, Mr. Chair, recently we have seen a new initiative in reproductive care. The province recently announced the Nova Scotia fertility and surrogacy rebate that applies equally for all Nova Scotians. This will help individuals and families cover some of the cost of fertility treatments or surrogacy related medical expenses. I would add Nova Scotia is the first province in Canada to provide this kind of support for surrogacy. Mr. Chair, we know there is still very much work to do in these and other areas. We will continue to look for opportunities to collaborate with our partners and stakeholders. In closing, I want to acknowledge and thank the many partners across the province, some of whom are present today, for being a voice for Nova Scotians and for the support they provide on the front lines for the services we will be discussing today. Thank you very much. Thank you, Deputy Minister. Uh, Ms. Oldfield, do you have opening remarks? Thank you, Mr. Chair. I do. Good morning, all. Fellow witnesses, thank you for having us here today. I would like to acknowledge, as you have, Mr. Chair, that April is Sexual Assault Awareness Month. We are now into the third year of the COVID pandemic, and we know that stress and isolation increase both the risk and the degree of violence in Canada with known increases in sexual violence, domestic violence, and femicide. In Nova Scotia, those who experience sexual assault have access to 24-7 through the Sexual Assault Nurse Examiner Program. And people can learn more about these services on our website at nshealth.ca slash sane, S-A-N-E. Birth control and sexual health services comprise a wide spectrum of services from various branches within and partners connected to our system. Today, you'll have the benefit of hearing from several of those involved in aspects of these services. These subjects very much illustrate how healthcare is not just a hospital-based system, and Nova Scotia Health is not the be-all and end-all of health services in the province. Rather, meeting the health needs of Nova Scotians is a partnership among large and small agencies, specialists, family doctors, providers, and communities. So for many, issues related to sexual health are managed by their regular primary care provider or their pharmacist or a clinic in the community that may offer confidential advice. Others may require support navigating the system or care from a hospital-based specialist. We also recognize that all, not all Nova Scotians have access to a regular primary care provider, or if they do, are comfortable going to that provider for sexual health needs. So having multiple ways to access services is important. When the Women's Choice Clinic was established in 2017 and the requirement for primary care referral to access abortion services eliminated, some barriers to care were removed. We now have self-referral process, a central intake number, and a network of providers around the province willing to prescribe medical abortion. Still, gaps and barriers remain. We need to expand the network of providers to ensure people in all parts of the province have access to this care close to home. Our organization is proud to have a long-standing Pride Health Service that works to improve access to health services which are safe, 
coordinated, comprehensive, and culturally appropriate for people who are two-spirit, lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, queer, intersex, and asexual. That service has not expanded over time, although demand has. While we work with partners to better meet the needs of people of diverse gender identity and sexuality, I want to be clear that as with our organizational need to address systemic racism and be more welcoming to our patients and staff who are black, indigenous, and people of color, the responsibility fall, falls to all of us, not just those people in positions focused on that work. Inequities in the system or experiences that leave people feeling unwelcome affect health, safety, opportunity, confidence in the system, and sense of self, and that has to change. I look forward to our discussion here this morning. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Oldfield. Ms. Painter, do you have any opening remarks? Um, one of the most significant barriers to reproductive health equity in Nova Scotia and Canada is the cost of contraception. Providing free contraception results in significant cost savings and improvements in population health. Governments save between $7 and $10 for every dollar invested in contraception. As a nurse providing abortion care, I see how patients return again and again because while abortion services are rightly publicly funded, contraception is not and abortion becomes the only recourse. The cost to Nova Scotia taxpayers of an abortion procedure is roughly $2,000. Compare this to $400 for an intrauterine device that provides effective birth control for five years, or even $30 for a monthly pack of birth control pills. Contraception is a wise investment. When people can plan their pregnancies, evidence shows they are better able to care for their families complete their education, achieve employment, and less likely to experience intimate partner violence and poverty. Yet, in Canada, half of all pregnancies are unintended, and one in every three people with a uterus will have an abortion in their lifetime. Unintended pregnancies are disproportionately experienced by people already marginalized, by poverty, discrimination, and social exclusion. Access to free contraception can break this cycle. Recognizing the key role of contraception in healthy growth and development, the Canadian Pediatric Society recommends governments provide universal access to no-cost contraception to all youth under 25. One of the most innovative and important changes to sexual health services in Nova Scotia over the past decade was the introduction of self-referral for abortion services and public funding of a centralized hotline, 1-833-352-0719. This approach reduced wait times and costs and improved outcomes. Nova Scotia can continue to demonstrate public sector leadership in sexual health by committing to free contraception for all. Providing free contraception will result in significant cost savings and improvements in population health for the people of this province. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Painter. Dr. Brooks, do you have any opening remarks? Thank you. Uh, good morning and thank you for the invitation to meet with this committee. Um, so I would like to begin my, by my remarks by sharing that access to abortion services within Nova Scotia have significantly improved in recent years, but there's still more work that needs to be done. Eliminating the requirement for referral to the Women's Choice Clinic and universal access to Mifigai Miso, the drug used for medical abortion, are great steps forward. However, despite that uh, abortion is one of the most common gynecologic procedures or surgeries. Patients seeking surgical abortion are often forced to leave their community uh, to access this service. Also, Nova Scotia is one of the few provinces in Canada that does not provide elective termination of pregnancy past 16 weeks gestational age. People in need of this service often have to travel out of a province, which is a huge barrier that often prevents them from accessing the service entirely. Uh, I would be remiss if I didn't uh, agree with Dr. Painter uh, to say that uh, the, uh, the one area that I think Nova Scotia uh, could make great advances in reproductive services is in providing universal access to contraception. In Nova Scotia, as in many provinces around the country, the lack of access to universal pharmacare creates a huge gap in access to contraception, especially long-acting reversible contraception such as IUDs and subdermal contraceptive implants. We know that one in three workers in Nova Scotia does not have access to private prescription drug coverage and family pharmacare does not fill the gap adequately. 
Uh, I see this almost on an a, a daily basis in my clinical practice. Research from around the globe has shown that providing barrier-free access to contraception is not only cost-effective, but provides, long, uh, uh, provides cost savings in the long run. Nova Scotia could be a leader in Canada in advancing reproductive care with universal contraceptive access. As I mentioned, I want to reiterate that there are good things happening in reproductive care in Nova Scotia, but there's still much work to be done and alternative solutions to consider. I thank you for inviting me to participate in this session today. I'm more than happy to answer any questions and to work with members of the committee to improve reproductive care for all Nova Scotians. Thank you, Dr. Brooks. Uh, Mix Hyde, do you have any opening remarks? I do, thank you. So good morning, thanks for having me. Um, I wanted to tell you a little bit about Sexual Health Nova Scotia, um, as I frequently get the who <laughs> question. So Sexual Health Nova Scotia is a community-based nonprofit provincial organization, uh, of which I'm the provincial coordinator. We encompass a network of six sexual health centers across the province. So those are in Cape Breton, in Pictou County, in Cumberland County, Sheet Harbor, Halifax Sexual Health Center, and South Shore, which serves Lunenburg and Queens counties. So through advocacy, education, navigation, and partnership, we support members of our communities to access the sexual health services they need. Halifax Sexual Health Center is currently the only center in our network that houses a full-time clinic. Our five rural centers all provide support and health navigation for folks seeking clinical sexual health services. And they also advocate for increased sexual health services, such as STI testing, gender-affirming care, access to birth control in their communities. All of our centers provide free, safer sex supplies to the public uh, to high demand. Uh, they provide all of these services, plus many more, on extremely low and precarious funding. Our hope is that all people in the province can access comprehensive, inclusive, and affirming sexual health services when and where they need them. Unfortunately, this is not a reality we see very often right now in Nova Scotia. The COVID pandemic has exacerbated already challenging situations, specifically for youth, those living rurally and low income, 2S LGBTQ plus folks, racialized, disabled, and other folks who've been traditionally underserved in the healthcare system. We hope that conversations like the one that we'll have today will impact the system of healthcare in ways that will make critical, essential sexual health services available in all our communities. Thanks. Thanks, Mix Hyde. So that, that concludes our opening remarks. So we're gonna get into the Q&A uh, side of it. So the, so the way it works for, for those of you who are new to it is um, each, each caucus gets 20 minutes um, to ask questions to witnesses. Uh, following those 20 minutes, there will be, depending on how much time we have left, we're gonna go to probably 1040. So we'll, we'll, we'll break it up into three equal parts for um, rapid fire, we call it here. And, um, and so they'll get some more questions on, on the other side. Um, I would remind everybody to just wait to be recognized so, so that it, it'll all come through the chair. So, and that way there, Ledge TV can um, get your mics on so that, um, so that it can be heard. Um, and then after that, we'll have closing, uh, some closing remarks from our witnesses as well. So with that being said, uh, the Liberal Caucus um, will, will begin. And I see Ms. Di Costanza, uh, your you've got your hand up, so. Thank you, Mr. Chair, uh, and, and welcome to all. And I'm sure this is going to be a very interesting um, conversation. And, and hopefully, we all can learn from this and, and the value of uh, birth control to women and, uh, and the access. Uh, and one of the things that I was really happy about when our, uh, my colleague um, Randy Delory brought in the uh, the increased scope for pharmacists and giving them birth control was one of the major ones that, uh, beside renewal of medications and others, I was really excited. My daughter is a pharmacist and I know how much they were fighting to get more, um, to do more with their scope because they're very well educated and, and know how to do this. But also with pharmacists, uh, the access is the best thing because it is so much easier to go to your pharmacy sometimes and to get an appointment with a doctor. And, and some, you know, I have a very good relationship with my pharmacist over many years. So to me, that was a very good move uh, to allow pharmacists to take over to increase access for women. And uh, my question, I hope, is are you tracking how many pharmacists are prescribing birth control? and how many clients are being served, uh, and what birth controls are being prescribed, 
uh, what other learning about the access? How that has, uh, where are we with that, if you don't mind? So, Emily Di Costanza, who would you like to direct that question to? Lagasse. We'll start with the deputy and then she can give it to whoever. Perfect. <laughs> thank Depu you. Deputy Minister Lagasse. Right, thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Um, so, as I said in my opening remarks, kind of the expanded scope of practice for pharmacists, um, and in fact, then the uh, contraception management consultation service began in 2020. So I can't tell you how many pharmacists are actually doing the service, but they are all able to within their scope of practice. But that I can tell you that within the first year of the initiative, about 4,000 people uh, gained access that service through community pharmacies. MLA Di Costanza. Do we have any idea if uh, certain medication, uh, are they doing the um, same as what doctors are doing? Or, um so 4,000, and what was it before? Uh, has it increased because of pharmacists compared to doctors, if you don't mind? Deputy Minister Lagasse. So the 4,000 number is just the pharmacy service itself. So when the expanded scope of practice came in in 2020, that would be the number for that first year of the service, pharmacists uh, alone. Um, I can tell you also that in that same year, 2021, that about 60,000 people filled prescriptions for contraceptive products across the province. That comes from our drug information system. MLA Di Costanza. Thank you, and, and, and that these are good numbers, and I hope we are, you know, most young ladies or, or women are able to access this uh, through the pharmacist. The other question when it comes to pharmacists, what training has been provided to them when it comes to um, stigma and uh, culture appropriate? Uh, you know, there are many newcomers and, um, and, and different religions that is not uh, accepting of uh, birth control. Are pharmacists being trained? What do we know about that? Deputy Minister Lagasse. So I do know when there's expanded scope of practice like that, that there usually are training programs through the College of Pharmacists and also through the Pharmacy Association of Nova Scotia, that all pharmacists have a continuing uh, education requirement to maintain their license. So there are training programs through, through those organizations. Some of my other partners may have other information they may want to contribute. Does, did any other witness have any further? Ms. Painter? Um, I wanted to respond to two things. Uh, the first is, in, in light of you raising the issue of cultural appropriate, um, can we in this session use uh, gender inclusive language? Um, practice that. It does take some getting used to, but we can do it. Um, my second comment is with respect to, it's fantastic that that scope was expanded, obviously, uh, no question. But when the most effective contraception are long-acting reversible means, like the IUD and Nexplan on the implant, uh, the, the pharmacist can't insert those. So we have you know, a, a device in hand that, great, they could prescribe, but how are you gonna use it <laughs> if you don't have a clinician who can insert the device? Not to mention the cost that we, Dr. Brooks and I, have already raised. So those are my two comments. MLA Di Costanza. Thank you, and I appreciate that very much, especially for the first one. Um, there's my... Sorry, I'm just trying to make sure I have the right question here. Um, okay, so, uh, of course, access to birth control is a preventative measure but one uh, that access for a variety of reasons, uh, that is access to safe, uh, confidential, stigma-free ab abortion is important to those who want a termination of pregnancy. Curious, we are learning a lot about the impact of COVID on different aspects of healthcare and access to abortion would be no different. What impact have we seen uh, and reduce staffing across health authorities, and how is that service being offered at the moment? And MLA Di Costanza, who would you like to? Direct? La Grasse, and, and she can afford it, no? Um, Deputy COVID. Minister, <laughs> Deputy Minister Lagasse? 
Uh, I think that would be a, more of a service delivery question, so I think I'd have to ask one of our partners to answer that one. Dr. Brooks, I see your hand up. I can probably speak to that a bit. Um, so our clinic, the Women's Choice Clinic, um, has stayed open the entire time. We never closed. Uh, we certainly did have some reduction in staff at times. Some of our staff were um, uh, moved to different areas of the hospital to provide um, backup for places that were uh, higher needs, but we continued to function. There were certainly times when our wait list maybe got a bit longer because of that, but overall we've managed to cope. Um, one thing that has changed during the pandemic globally really is that um, more people are providing medical abortion um, through telemedicine and that's been a thing also in Nova Scotia so that's um, been I think a, a very good improvement and change that's occurred during the pandemic um, and access to things like ultrasound and certainly I guess one of the big barriers is access to quick um, like blood work services because with the um, needing to make appointments for, for blood work, office. it's often hard to get a blood work appointment within a few days, if even a month. Uh, so that's been a bit of a challenge for us, but overall abortion services, we've managed to keep them um, going. And I think there has been some improvements in abortion care and in, 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 uh, providing it through telemedicine. MLA de Costanza. Thank you, and that's good to hear, fantastic that uh, we're expecting. Um, there were over 16, uh, uh, 1,600 reported abortions per year uh, at four Nova Scotia Health Authority sites offering surgical and chemical abortions. Uh, on average, how many people access the service annually right now? Dr. Brooks, did you want to try? Yeah, the, there, because of the changes with, so, um, uh, Mifigai Miso, that's the medication that we use to um, provide uh, medical abortion. So a lot of that, I think it was kind of brought up that we have our clinic, the Women's Choice Clinic, we also have a network of abortion providers that we people will call in who need abortions and we can refer them to as people in their own community. Um, so we can track those numbers, but there certainly may be people outside of our network in various places in the provinces that prescribe Mifigai Miso, and so we wouldn't actually know about about that through the Women's Choice Clinic. So we don't, because of that, we have maybe less accurate numbers. Before when we were the only game in town, so to speak, uh, we could say that we basically do all the abortions and there was usually around 13 to 1500 a year. Um, it, it seems like that number has gone down and it's not clear if that's because the number of abortions in the province has gone down or if that's because there are people in their own communities who are doing them without us, without our knowledge. Um, so yeah, it seems like there's a decrease, but it could just be that there are more people providing them outside of our network. I see Ms. Painter has her hand up as well. Ms. Painter? Add a couple of things to add a couple of things to what Dr. Brooks was saying. So um, one of the things that happened in 2017, the PEI opened their clinical services and, and PEI used to rely on us. So that was about 150 cases a year that are now repatriated to PEI to look after themselves. So that's one of the things. As Dr. Brooks said, we have over two dozen prescribers in our network, physicians and uh, nurse practitioners who do the prescribing in their home communities. And from the 1833 number, the nurses at the clinic make all of the arrangements for ultrasound, for blood work, for the referral to the physician. So it expedites things for patients who are, who are using that service, but it does cause this disconnection in the data. However, if we look to the number of uh, scripts for Mifigamiso, we can get that total number. Um, so it's, it's just pulling that data together. And then the last thing I wanted to respond to was, um, although we did have slight increases in our wait times, I want everybody to understand that it's extremely fast to get an abortion through uh, the clinic uh, a week in general. Um, so wait times has a very different meaning in this world than arthroplasty. <laughs> MLA de Costanzo. That's understandable, and it, you really have to move fast and to offer it. Uh, and and uh, in 2018, there was a study of family medicine residents, uh, students, and they found that 79% of recipients reported never ob observing or assisting with an abortion. 
during their training, and 80% of residents uh, reported receiving less than one hour of uh, education on abortion. Uh, and I, I have the information, and I can table that. Has, uh, has that changed, and what specific training is provided here in Nova Scotia to build more capacity for our doctors? Dr. Brooks, I, I see you're, yeah. you're nodding. Probably we'll take that. Um, so uh, I also am an assistant professor at Dalhousie. So one of my colleagues, Dr. Yoshida, who works at the clinic with us, she does do a lecture for the family medicine residents here at Dal on medical abortion. So in uh, Canada, most early surgical abortions are done by family doctors. You're right. But most family doctors wouldn't come out of family medicine residency competent to do that. Most of them would require additional training. Um, certainly at the clinic, we are open to um, accommodating residents that are interested in abortion provision. So we will have family medicine residents come and rotate at our clinic, but it's not a standard rotation for all residents that's required for family medicine residents. And then for our gynecology residents, they all do rotate through the, the clinic. And most gynecologists, because the DNC for an abortion is similar to DNCs we do for other reasons, would be competent to complete at least an early abortion at the end of their training. So, I mean, I think it is a different world now with medical abortion because medical abortion would require much less training and most family doctors could be competent to do that. So they are all receiving at least a lecture on medical abortion and then they're welcome to come to our clinic. Um, the teaching clinic at Dell and the family medicine teaching clinic, they're also looking at incorporating medical abortion into their clinics as well. Emma Lady Costanza. Oh, go oh, ahead, please. I see Miss <laughs> Miss Painter. Sorry, I apologize, Miss Painter. And one other thing, Dr. Brooks and I also uh, lead an interprofessional six-hour course across all of the health professional faculties at Dalhousie. So social work, nursing, nurse practitioner, um, and medicine, pharmacy are all uh, welcome to take this course. And it has expanded education over the past two years of its offering. We've... Um, trained, I think, about 250 students. So uh, that's novel to DAL and uh, doesn't exist anywhere else. And MLA de Costanza? So do, do I understand that as optional, not uh, obligatory to take this course? Ms. Ms. Painter? That's correct. It's part of the obligatory interprofessional education uh, regimen, um, but the students choose between different options in that menu of uh, course offerings. MLA de Costanza. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, there are only four locations where surgical abortions are offered through the NSHA. That includes Women's Choice Clinic at the QE2, uh, QE2 South Shore Regional and the Valley Regional, and Colchester East Hands Health Centre. Missing from this is the locations in Yarmouth, Amherst, Antigonish, and Sydney. What is being done to, uh, the, for the NHA's uh, A to expand the access? MLA de Costanza, would you like to? Um, maybe Karen O'Field? <laughs> Ms. O'Field. Thank you. Let me start by saying I'm, I'm listening intently, I'm learning intently, and one of the things that I am trying really hard to do today is to figure out where I may need to further advocate and do additional transformation within our healthcare system. I don't know the answer to your question. I've made a note, and so we will get back to you. MLA de Costanza? That's a very honest reply, and I thank you for that. Thank you. Oh, I, I, I see Dr. Brooks's oh, oh. hand up as well, if, 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 you, if you wish. I, I mean, I could speak to what I think some of the barriers are in those places to not offering access. So I used to be an obstetrician gynecologist in Truro in Colchester, and I did abortions when I was there too. Um, so in places outside of the Nova Scotia Women's Choice Clinic, it's generally gynecologists in the community who are doing them. So generally there would be kind of two issues. One is there isn't a gynecologist willing to provide the service. Uh, but more often than not, it's sort of institutional barriers in terms of uh, whether it's 
being able to provide the service. So often they're done in the OR, so you need kind of extra OR time. You need anesthetists and nurses who are willing to participate, which is often a barrier. Uh, I, you know, I know that there are gynecologists in um, Cape Breton Regional Hospital as well as in Cumberland who would be more than willing to do abortions, but the, and despite their best efforts, they've never been able to get everyone on board to provide that service, um, whether it's because there are people within their hospital who are you know, actively anti-choice and blocking the service being uh, available, or it's more in terms of the sort of services that are available and things like that. So uh, I think it, it is either having access to the gynecologist or other barriers in terms of instituting that service. MLA de Costanzo, you have three minutes. Um, so <laughs> and, and, and I apologize to witnesses who I haven't, I, I do cut off at, at a hard stop at the 20 okay. minutes, so if you're in the middle of, a, of an answer, I apologize. Sorry. Uh, I will pass the last three minutes to my colleague, and then in the second half, she can take over as well. Thank you. MLA and Nicole. Thank you, and good morning. Nova Scotians who have experienced sexualized violence require specialized emergency care, and they need to be able to access that care anywhere in the province. Sexual assault nurse examiners are vital. They provide specialized medical and forensic emergency care, including supportive care, evidence collection, and sharing information. Under the last government, this service was available at 18 hospitals and health centers 24 hours a day and seven days a week. I think you mentioned that. How many nurses are employed to deliver this service across the province, and how many victims, on average, are they supporting? I don't know if that would be Karen Oldfield of Legacy. De Deputy Minister Legacy, is that? Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. I can give you a few of the statistics that I have. Uh, so there are seven staff currently across the province, and there are now 20 sites. That, uh, where the service can be uh, accessed. It is, as you said, a 24-7 service that people can uh, contact. And as of March 2022, uh, there were approximately 240 people who accessed the program in 2021-22. MLA Nicol. Thank you. So knowing the staffing challenges, obviously, and to you clarify, you said 26 locations is what you're referring to? Uh, Deputy Minister Lagasse? 20. 20. Two zero. And so, so the way oh, sorry, MLA N Nickel, and, and just bring your mic down a little bit. There you go. Okay. We're breaking the rules. It usually works the other way around. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Knowing the staffing challenges that during the COVID-19 wave is having on our healthcare system, is it still a dedicated service provided in all hospitals? Have these nurses been pulled off their duties to care or deployed to, and allocated elsewhere? Deputy Minister Legasse? Uh, not that we are aware of, that the nurses have been taken off the service. We also have a VON who helps to provide the service in some of the locations throughout the province. MLA Nickel. That was my next question. The VON is expanding access in the Eastern Shore area, and you're, you're mentioning that, but are there any other services gaps that exist? And are, is it just in the Eastern Shore where the VON is providing that service? Deputy Minister Legasse. I, I do not know if there were the other locations, but we'll just take a quick look and we'll try to get back to you on that. Emily Nickel, you have oh, 15 cool. seconds. Uh, Should I do a little dance in 15 <laughs> seconds? <laughs> not going to get into it. I, I will uh, wait for the 15 seconds to go by. Perfect. <laughs> Thank you. And um, that, that is the uh, Liberal time is up. It is now the NDP caucus's turn to ask questions. I see. MLA LeBlanc with her hand up and you may begin. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you very much for everyone, to, to you all for being here. I just wanted to follow up on, on that question actually before I begin my regular questions, and that is, I just want to clarify that the deputy said that there are seven staff over 20 sites that provide sexual assault nurse examiner services, but the service is 24 seven. And I just don't understand how that's at all possible. Like that just, I can't square that circle. So I'm wondering, uh, you've mentioned the VON, but I mean, I assume that the answer is that someone who's been sexually assaulted and goes for those services has to wait for several hours before they're seen. So can you just confirm how that all works? I see Miss Penny with her hand up. 
Thank you for the question. The seven full-time equivalents uh, that uh, Deputy Minister Legassi uh, referenced is really some coordination positions uh, and some management positions. And so it doesn't necessarily mean that there are only seven sexual assault nurse pro examiner providers across the province. We use VON services. There are nursing staff that are uh, on call 24-7 for ver a variety of uh, service delivery areas across the province. MLA LeBlanc. Thank you. Um, okay, uh, well, that's, you know, better. <laughs> um, but do people, when people present at the hospital or, or at one of these sites, do you have a sort of sense of how long folks have to wait before they are seen by a, by a SANE nurse? Ms. Penny? I, d I don't have that information off the top of my um, uh, head, uh, although I would say that uh, when coming to the emergency department, uh, People can access sexual assault in kind of three or four different ways. So one is is that they can actually call and, and self-refer themselves uh, with the numbers that are provided um, uh, to Miss Oldfield's uh, Nova Scotia Health uh, website. Uh, and then um, uh, oftentimes the sexual assault nurse examiner will come to the emergency department or the facility where the person presented or uh, if it's safe and, and uh, appropriate, we may actually get the person who has unfortunately had, had that unfortunate trauma to where the sexual assault nurse examiner is, because uh, it may be a more appropriate area. Um, or we could actually have a conversation and a collaboration across the current emergency department provider and the sexual assault nurse examiner so that they could actually collaborate together. Uh, uh, and, and it really does depend on which stream to take, uh, which is the most appropriate for the person who's experienced the trauma. MLA LeBlanc. Thank you very much. Um, well, I, I, so I'm going to go back to my original plan here. Um, we are really glad that everyone is here today. We're very um, happy to be hearing from you all. Um, I feel like it's important to set the stage a little bit right now. We have a new government that has just released its first budget, and the budget has no new funding for access to midwifery, sexual health services, collaborative or community health services, pride health, or particular commitments to expanding re reproductive or sexual health inside our public system. And so, uh, and you know, we've already heard from so many of you who are experts in this field today, in this short amount of time, um, how attention to these these uh, services and, and, and this type of health care can not only, um, you know, um, well, it's just better for individuals who are getting that service, but also saves the system a ton of money and a ton of um, uh, people power, as it were. Uh, and so um, when the government promises to fix health care, it has to mean women's health, sexual health, and reproductive health too. And so um, uh, I just want to start by asking Dr. Hatchett, and by the way, Dr. Hatchett, I just have to say that you will not remember this probably, but you taught me <laughs> how to do a nasal swab <laughs> in Dartmouth North at one of the amazing uh, first testing sites. And so you are my teacher, and I went on to swab many, many, many hundreds of people probably in, <laughs> in rapid testing site areas. So I feel like I'm like, you know, meeting my mentor again. Um, <laughs> Um, anyway, I want to start by asking you, because you are in the system right now. Uh, I want to ask a little bit about our, the state of our healthcare system and the impact on people's ability to access everything from di diagnostic imaging or routine procedures to elective surgeries. So we know that COVID has had a significant impact on the healthcare system, but the situation is particularly bad right now. Uh, I just read a CBC article that came out today. Um, uh, that that quotes Dr. Lisa Barrett um, about we are like now <laughs> we used to be you know number one in the country and it seems like now we're we're um, you know quite far behind other other jurisdictions and so whether it be more than um, more people than at any point waiting for five years of waiting for surgery thousands of people waiting for CT scans ultrasound or MRI thousands of surgery cancellations people are very scared about their ability to access health care in particular in these new like in this new whatever we're in, the sixth wave, whatever it is, like things just seem to be getting really feeling a bit out of control. So um, my question to you, Dr. Hatchett, is what is the most concerning to you about the state of our health care system at the moment? Dr. Hatchett. Uh, thanks, and I'm flattered that uh, you remember me as a mentor. Um, <laughs> That's a tough question. I mean, our healthcare system has been strapped uh, prior to the pandemic. This has only amplified uh, the issues. Um, 
in addition to sort of the excess uh, that COVID has put on in terms of inpatient care, all of the other ancillary services have been impacted and, and, and will continue to be impacted as long as people continue to get infected with COVID. You know, we, we are seeing lots of, of uh, staff off. Uh, these are staff that are necessary to provide the uh, inpatient services. They're the staff that are necessary to provide the outpatient services. So family physicians, uh, lab support staff, DI staff, you know, if this is the new normal, then we need to account for that and take it into consideration as we make HR planning, et cetera. Um, you know, I think that uh, we can look at technologies to try and improve uh, some of the services, but ultimately it comes down to people. And if the people are off sick, you're going to have to take that into account. And if, and if this is going to go on for weeks, which the modeling suggests it will, uh, we'll need to make sure that we try to staff things appropriately. MLA LeBlanc. Great, thank you very much. Um, I hope it's not the new normal. <laughs> I hope that the old normal is not the new normal. Um, I hope we can actually address some of the issues, the systemic issues, as you say. So I'm wondering if you have any thoughts about what the government can do right now to turn the corner on the healthcare backlogs um, in general. Dr. Hatchett. So I, I think that, um, uh, again, Preemptively thinking of where the funding is going to be required and knowing that we're going to have shortages in people and staff, I think, is, is the biggest one. And that's not an easy challenge to overcome. It has been highlighted that, uh, uh, you know, nursing staff, uh, physicians, allied health care workers are in short supply, and uh, this is only exacerbating that. Um, you know, the uh, Nova Scotians had the tools at hand to try and prevent COVID from happening. Um, whether that horse is out of the barn is a bigger question. And, you know, there's tons of COVID out there uh, based on our positivity rates and what we're seeing uh, in terms of absenteeism. Uh, we, we've got lots of COVID out there and I don't think it's gonna be an easy thing to turn around. MLA LeBlanc. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And so, um uh, we've seen STI uh, testing uh, scaled back to make capacity for COVID testing. Can you comment on the impacts on access to sexual and reproductive health during the pandemic and now? Dr. Hatchett. Um, so absolutely. So there, there are two aspects to the, to the question. One will be the clinical access to care. And uh, early on in the pandemic, uh, pretty well all outpatient care was shut down. Uh, so for those that require access through their family physician, that was difficult. Uh, access to family physicians uh, is a challenge. Uh, our clinic was shut down as well because of the all outpatient care was shut down within the health authority. Um, as things progressed, we were able to um, keep the clinic open and modify what we do so that uh, we can try to increase the number of patients seen, um, both by making it a appointment based, a same day appointment based clinic rather than the sort of first come first serve uh, that it had been. In addition, we tried a what's called a what I call an asymptomatic stream, where individuals uh, will call, uh, discuss their um, issues with the the nurse, and if they don't need to see a physician, meaning they just want to get gonorrhea and chlamydia screening, we actually set up their specimen collection kits to be picked up at the front desk. They go and they collect their specimens themselves and just drop it off, and they never have to see a physician. So that that's increased the ability to people get to get screening for gonorrhea and chlamydia in, in particular. Uh, which has been actually quite effective. We do have positive cases that are then uh, followed up with uh, in our clinic or called in a prescription uh, by one of the attending physicians. So we have made modifications to our clinic to try and, and accommodate the challenges for COVID, which actually have been uh, well received. Uh, I think the, the patients actually appreciate the fact that they don't have to wait hours to be seen like they had to with the first come first serve given the same day appointments. I can't really comment on turnaround times because it is a same day appointment. We're only open Mondays and Thursdays. We do uh, turn people away um, because the, the booking slots are filled. So we probably could have a, a day or two more and still have uh, um, room to, to uh, increase the availability to STI screening. We predominantly are an STI clinic. So we, we do the, the screening prevention, but we don't do a lot of the birth control um, provision or anything uh, along those lines. It's, it's more um, screening for STI, STBBI, so also bloodborne infections. We, we do draw blood in the clinic, which I think is one of the 
Uh, reasons why people like coming to the clinic is that the, it's a one-stop shop. So our nurses uh, will draw the blood on individuals who want screening for things like syphilis and HIV and um, they don't have to book another appointment with blood collection, which has been a challenge during the, the uh, pandemic. So then if we switch to sort of lab provision of services, there's no question that um, the pandemic has uh, provided <clears throat> unprecedented challenges from a lab system perspective, right from uh, access to the specimen collection, whether that be blood collection or um, any of the other testing we do. Uh, we do have a pandemic plan, which we follow quite closely and we prioritize specimens that need to be suspended in order to uh, redeploy the resources to ensure that we can meet the needs for any emergency, COVID being the one here. And unfortunately, you know, STI services is, are, are part of that in, in the, the gonorrhea and chlamydia test that we do is probably the prior to COVID was the largest uh, volume of testing that we would do in our lab. And uh, those resources just had to be redeployed. Um, they were suspended uh, during each wave for about a month, but then reopened. And um, since that time, we've acquired some new instruments so that we've been able to maintain services even during this wave. But it has been a significant challenge um, to ensure that we can, can do those. And unfortunately, they, they just had to be uh, paused for a time. MLA LeBlanc. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair and Dr. Hatchett. I'm gonna change my focus for a moment uh, and ask some questions of the department. Uh, in the past years, our caucus has raised the issue many times of access to prescription contraceptives, and we've heard, heard about it today, uh, pointing out the contradiction in the fact that MSI will cover access to abortion, both medical and pharmaceutical, but not the preventative access to birth control. As we've heard, an IUD can cost $400 or $30 for a pack of, uh, like a, a month of, of um, oral contraceptives. Um, and while they may be covered under family pharmacare or private insurance, or sometimes the Department of Community Services, depending on who you're talking to, uh, it's not covered by MSI. So is the department looking at the full coverage of any other forms of prescription contraceptives? I guess I'll ask that to the deputy. Deputy Minister Legasse. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you for the question. So uh, through in our minister's mandate letter, uh, there is a requirement to um, look at the formulary and how we uh, put drugs onto the formulary. And so there will be a review of everything process and uh, what is currently on the formulary through that process. Um, the other thing about devices is that we do currently have, currently Pharmacare, as you've said, cover drugs, not devices, right? And so I think that that's the big, other big issue that we're looking at right now is how the process is to be able to uh, get, to, to, to determine what devices we may put onto the formulary. MLA LeBlanc. <laughs> Thank you. Um, sure, yes. Uh, this, is, this is a conversation we had, I remember, last year at some point where we talked about uh, the, the former health minister, um, you know, had some reason why this didn't work very well because, you know, people, like, the, the device is not covered, but the people are covered. And as Dr. Brooks has pointed out, your, or sorry, um, Dr. Painter has pointed out that you need someone to insert the device. And so that part is covered, but not the device. It's very complicated, but surely, 2022, we can figure this kind of thing out. And so I understand um, that you're looking at the formula, formulary and there's lots of, I, I, I mean, there's so many pressures on the formulary. I get it, which is, you know, why we should have universal pharmacare. Um, but um, when you're looking at the formulary, do you have a metric? So like we've heard from these experts that this type of um, provision would save lots and lots of money. We've heard that, you know, like an abortion costs $2,000 compared to 400 uh, and times that by however many people are accessing. So is that, is that part of the metric that goes into it if we're talking about how to fix health care and say, find the savings where we, and then redeploying the savings in other places? Are you looking at that type of, that type of metric? Deputy Minister Legasse. Uh, the work on that mandate item is in its very early stages, but I think as CEO Oldfield has already said, to be here today for us to hear from uh, the other partners who are here today is, is very valuable, right? So there's information that I will take back to the department from today's session to be able to speak with folks in the pharmaceutical section of the department to say, here are some areas we should look at, here are some people we should talk to, right? And different ways, so again, listening and learning and taking it back to inform that review. I, I, 
I see Dr. Brooks has oh, sure. her, her hand up as well. I just wanted to make a, a comment about the family pharma care because I think there is a bit of a misconception about family pharma care and I mentioned that it doesn't really fill the gap. So with family pharma care, there's a deductible and the deductible is based on your income and I've never been able to find any document that really explains well how it's calculated. But for most young, healthy people, they're not on a lot of medication. So often they don't have enough prescriptions to meet the deductible. So then when they want an IUD, an IUD costs $400. They haven't, even if they have family pharmacare, they haven't had any, enough prescriptions to get through their deductible. They still have to pay $400. So it doesn't really help those young, healthy people. I think family pharmacare is great for someone who maybe has a lot of drug costs, if they have chronic health problems or things like that. For, but for the young, healthy people trying to access contraception, it doesn't help. And that's why at, a, at the Women's Choice Clinic, we uh, will get donations to get to buy IUDs that we can give out to people who don't have access to drug coverage. And at the Department of Community Services, coverage does cover hormonal IUDs. So Morena and Kylina doesn't cover copper IUDs. Um, but we give them out like candy. <laughs> like literally we go through hundreds and we could go through hundreds more. We give them out so at least a few a day. So it, there are so many people at our clinic that that need that service and it just, they, they fall through the cracks of the system. Uh, Dr. Painter, and I apologize for not um, saying doctor previously. Months until my defense. So you got okay. one more month of news. <laughs> then it's Dr. Martha forever. Okay, I two points. Um, one is, um, there is a missing piece to this that we have to come back to again and again and again, and that is that this entire discussion is gendered. And to exclude these uh, products, <laughs> um, whether it be the copper IUD, which is actually quite infrequently used, or any of the hormonal options, it's, it's a gender equity issue, and not funding it is very simply gender discrimination. Very pure and simple. So that's our baseline here. We're operating in a context of daily discrimination against the people with uteruses in this province. The second piece is that, um, so we, we are just so happy when we have these free IUDs that we can give out. This is just the best thing ever. Um, but you cannot model your contraception uh, program on the IUD alone, having only one option um, and an option that you have to insert through the cervix is frankly a coercive regime. You have to offer people options. They cannot, to protect themselves from un, um, unintended pregnancy, only have one way to go that you um, or uh, a charity or a government have determined this is the one acceptable way, okay? We are continuing to deal with the legacy of a colonial abuse against Indigenous people's very bodies, and we have to be very conscious of the message it sends when only one approach is acceptable to this province. Thank you. MLA LeBlanc, you have 45 seconds. Okay, well, I'd love to hear from uh, Mix Hyde there. Mick, Mix, Mix Hyde? Yeah, thank you. Um, I really want a second and third and fourth, everything you just said, and also wanted to make the point that um, our sexual health centers, uh, one of the things that they do is operate a contingency fund or compassionate care fund. They're called different things. So essentially when clients say, you know, I need plan B or I need to access birth control, I can't afford it. There are sometimes little pockets of money that our organizations from donations and project grants, like whatever, have pulled together to help out folks. I want to make the point that our five rural centers operate on an annual operational budget of less than $50,000 a year. And these little compassionate care funds is something they've taken on because the healthcare system hasn't made it accessible for folks. Perfect timing. Oh, I was just <laughs> calling order. Um, the NDP time for first round is up. We now move on to the uh, PC uh, caucus. Um, who would like to, Mr. Palmer, you, you may begin. Thank you to all of you uh, for coming here today. It's uh, very clear we have a very knowledgeable panel of witnesses today and very passionate uh, group, and I appreciate that. And uh, I know all Nova Scotians appreciate um, everything you do uh, in, in your capacity. Um, 
I'd like to go back uh, to the topic of, of sexual violence prevention. And uh, it's been referenced a few times. This is um, uh, Sexual Assault Awareness Month. And, uh, you know, there are some uh, initiatives out there for communities and groups uh, in regards to sexual assault awareness and what can be done. And uh, in particular, the uh, Sexual Violence Prevention Innovation Grant uh, that provides up to $5,000 to support communities and groups. So uh, I guess I'll direct my question to Deputy Minister Legassi. Um, could you please talk to us a little bit, and maybe for those who might be watching uh, at home, uh, to share a bit about this grant and uh, tell us uh, what the impact you hope this uh, Sexual Violence Prevention Innovation Grant will have on communities who are applying for it. And uh, maybe as a second uh, to that, could you tell us of any uh, previous grant winners and some of the things that they have focused those grants on? Deputy Minister Legasse. Um, thank you for the question. I am not an expert on that program because it does fall under the Department of Community Services, that it's one of our partner, our department uh, partners who, who operate that program. So I wouldn't want to speak on their behalf. I apologize that I don't have a lot of information about that today because it is a DCS program. MLA Palmer. I appreciate that. We'll reach out to uh, Community Services to get that. Um, so. I'm going to switch gears again uh, and uh, talk a little bit about uh, those seeking to uh, become pregnant and uh, those seeking uh, fertility options uh, in our province. And uh, we all have friends, acquaintances, uh, people who've been uh, trying to uh, conceive or have a child for many years and uh, the, the difficulties and struggles uh, that they've had. And, uh, you know, reproductive care has been front and center for many years. And there are definitely families seeking treatment uh, and who, or who need surrogates to help them have a child or have often struggled with the high costs uh, that are involved in that. So I guess I'll direct my question uh, to Deputy Minister Legassi or anybody that on the panel that would like to uh, answer it. Um, could you tell us a little bit about the new fertility rebate program that the government has instituted uh, that is going to obviously help a lot of people, but could you tell us a bit more about that? And could, a secondary question, could you tell us how many families uh, you're expecting to benefit from this initiative uh, over the next little bit? Deputy Minister Legasse. Sure, thank you for the question. Um, the rebate covers uh, coverage for all people who require fertility treatments or to cover medical costs of surrogacy. Um, so there's no uh, limit on the number of treatments that an individual can claim, but the maximum claim is $20,000 per year with a maximum rebate of $8,000 on that. Um, the program is estimated for this year at about $3 million. Uh, so that's the, that would be the, the amount of, that we think that they will be used in the first year. MLA Palmer. And uh, just as a, as a follow-up, my follow-up question, uh, do you have an indication or do you, could you tell us maybe how many families uh, or individuals who will be able to uh, take advantage of that from any data that you might have? I think have the, oh, Deputy Minister Legasse. Apologize, Mr. Chair. That's okay. I think on kind of the straight math, it's about 375. MLA Palmer. Um, this program uh, is unique in, in Canada, but I was wondering if you might be able to share uh, with us how this program uh, compares to initiatives to support surrogacy taken in uh, other provinces. Is that something that uh, the deputy could uh, answer? Deputy Minister Legasse. Uh, it's, my, it's my understanding that this is the first program of its kind in Canada related to surrogacy costs. MLA Palmer. And just one last question I'll have uh, on this program for you. Um, and I'm not sure who might be able to answer this question, but uh, how do you feel this fills a gap compared to other tax credits that are out there? Like uh, what's deductible under the federal taxes? Would you have an idea of that? Deputy Minister Legasse. So I think that the thing about this program is that it's available to all Nova Scotians, right? That it's that they're really that anyone can come forward to access this particular program and that it cover, covers costs that are not covered through other programs and that's why the decision was made to structure it in the way that it is. 
MLA Palmer. So I just want to just finalize by saying thank you again for uh, all of your uh, your appearing today, and uh, I appreciate the question, the answer to the questions, and there's no doubt the program will definitely help many, many people seeking to uh, conceive and have a child. So thank you. I pass it on to uh, my colleague. MLA White. Thank you, Chair. Uh, Ms. Tanya Penny, I think I'm going back to you, I think to the uh, a sexual assault nurse and examiner program. I'm wondering if you can tell me a little more about how that works in rural areas. Ms. Penny. Thank you for the question. Um, so the sexual uh, nurse assault um, uh, examiners, they're, they're a group of registered nurses with advanced training. Uh, they have the ability to um, uh, testify in court and, and really have the competencies built up to make sure that we actually provide trauma-informed care. Um, so if you think about how this rolls out in a rural facility, uh, it could be, as I had mentioned earlier, um, uh, either the nurse examiner could present to the patient, depending on where the person um, uh, presented in the healthcare system. We could actually arrange for the person to get to the nurse if it's a more appropriate uh, area. Um, or there could be some conversations, uh, again, uh, virtually through the, the people at the facility where the person presented uh, and the sexual assault uh, nurse examiners program to make sure that that person's getting competent uh, and safe uh, trauma-informed care. MLA White. Thank you. Do, is it normal that in a rural area they expect delays just because of that system, the way it's working there? Is that typical or...? Ms. Penny. Uh, I, I, I wouldn't say that there are... I wouldn't say that there are delays, no. MLA White. Thank you. It's good to hear that. I think my next question is to Deputy Minister Lagasse. Uh, can you tell us a little more about the challenges people in rural areas face in general just with access and birth control? Deputy Minister Lagasse? Um, I actually don't know if I can answer that one, that I'd be the best person on the panel to answer that one. I think that maybe one of our partners at the end might be best. I see, I see Nix Hyde had, her, had uh, your hand up first. Yeah, I mean, so a lot of my answers come from um, hearing back from our sexual health centers in different rural areas and sort of their client experiences that are shared with them, right? Um, and so a lot of what we hear as barriers are um, lack of money, obviously, <laughs> we've talked about that today, um, but then lack of access as well. So not having a family doctor. Um, it, the pharmacy thing, the, the access to birth control through pharmacies is a good option that does help with rural area access as well, but it, there are limitations. There are some issues around kind of community pharmacies in small rural areas, right, and people feeling uncomfortable um, asking for things from a pharmacist they've known since they were five, which is my case in Mahone Bay. Um, and so that's one, that's one issue. And then I think access to transportation really also affects all of these things because for many healthcare services, folks have to travel. And that can be a huge barrier if they are you know, low income or they don't have access to transport, they're asking people to do them a favor. Um, our Halifax Sexual Health Center sees clients from all over the province. I mean, people driving from Cape Breton, people driving from Yarmouth regularly. This is not an anomaly. And so there's obviously those barriers around funding, transportation, and all of that to get to Halifax Sexual Health Center. Now, telemedicine has helped, I would say, um, and being able to get prescriptions that way. But there are so many sexual health services that you need to be seen in person. And when we talk about things like IUDs or the next one on insert, people need to see a doctor at the end of the day. I will share quickly an anecdotal story of a young person who contacted one of our centers to ask if they could insert the next one on insert themselves because they could not get an appointment uh, with a doctor and they were not sure how to go about it. And this was a, you know, a young person who watched a YouTube video and felt that they could probably do it. And of course, we <laughs> discouraged that strongly. Um, but that's that's not um, that's not a bizarre situation in the sense that we get calls frequently about people at their wits end trying to figure out how to get birth control or STI testing or any of the services they need in their small rural communities, especially. Um, there are huge barriers. I could go on, but I'll I'll pause. Dr. Brooks, I saw you're you're okay. MLA White. Oh, well, that's all my questions. Thank you very much. Thanks for the answer. I think I'm passing on to Emily Smith. 
Emily Smith. Thank you, Mr. Chair, uh, and thank you again for everyone for, for being here today. Um, <clears throat> Madame Lagasse, uh, I have a question for you to start. Uh, I only have a couple, um, and it's going to be about gender affirming care. So one of the things that, that I've said in other committees and, and when folks are, are asking me about this job is, uh, what do you like about it, what don't you like about it? And one of the things I like is I get to learn a lot of things that in, in, in other situations I may not know very much about. So gender affirming care is one of those things. So I'm wondering if in layperson terms, you can explain what that means to everyone here, and <clears throat> if you can explain what the province is doing to support folks who need gender-affirming care. Deputy Minister Legasse. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, if the member is okay, I'm going to ask Ms. Penny to take that particular question because the file for gender-affirming care does fall within her clinical branch in the department. Ms. Penny. Thank you very much for the question. And so what I would say is, is that all Nova Scotians um, really deserve options and access to health care uh, that meets their needs. And we know the transgender, gender diverse and intersex, Nova, intersex, Nova, intersex excuse me, Nova Scotians uh, are really experiencing challenges to accessing uh, appropriate and timely care. And the clinical portfolio uh, recognizes this and is very, very, very committed. Uh, to to redefining um, gender affirming care, and so when you think about gender affirming care, you think about it from a health promotion, um, a health prevention, uh, really a really holistic uh, approach, um, and gender affirming surgery is but one piece of gender affirming care, and so how how people uh, access health services in a culturally competent um, way is is hugely important to us. Emily Smith. Thank you again, Mr. Chair. Uh, this question, I'm going to turn to to Mix Hyde, and <clears throat> I don't want to get too personal uh, as as I sit here, but uh, I have a, a blended family and I have a, a stepchild, and and we're going through through some some things at that, at home that that uh, I personally may need some resources in the future as it relates to um, to gender confusion, gender uh, you know identity. Uh, so I'm just wondering what resources are out there for for parents, uh, step parents in situations that that need a little bit of, of extra help. Mix Hyde. Um, that's that's a great question, and I think um, uh, so. There's a lot of different answers. I guess it depends on what kind of resources uh, a person is looking for. So I will say first of all that. Um, Gender identity and sort of the, the full diversity of that needs to be covered in our healthcare, in our sorry education system, so that I mean we obviously know parents are going to play a big role in this, but so that they're supported, you know, the families are supported when kids are going to school and that they are able to, you know, be their their full selves at school, and then also for for all kids to learn about what gender identity means and all of that. Um, we know that that's um, unfortunately not happening the way that it needs to be. Um, part of that is is around curriculum part of it is certainly around you know the just knowledge and comfortability I don't think that's a word of, uh, of teachers you know um, and so there's just more training that needs to happen all around that um, and more you know funding resources that need to go into that um, in terms of kind of community resources um, we certainly have some within our network um, Halifax Sexual Health Center and uh, shins we call it for short so shns.ca there are some resources there um, I uh, we often will share from other organizations as well. Planned Parenthood Toronto has done some great resources on their site, teenhealthsource.ca. Um, so there's there's lots out there. I think in terms of, you know, youth being able to get uh, access to resources that meet their personal experience. Um, it's important to have a connection to an organization or a group that can answer, you know, those specific questions for youth and their families um, because resources won't always be tailored to what a youth is going through. Um, so I will obviously uh, shout out to the Youth Project here who, you know, are a wonderful partner organization of ours um, who could, like all of us, use more funding uh, for their programs and services. Um, but they're certainly, you know, a great organization for youth and families to reach out to. Um, what we would like to see though is that that resource support across the province because the Youth Project, you know, is one, one nonprofit with staff that are meant to be responsible to the whole province. That's really hard 
required to do, and that's the same for our, our sexual health centers. Our staff there will respond to questions, and we have a gender-affirming gear program at South Shore Sexual Health Center, which is amazing. So anyone of any age, um, any identity can access free or low-cost gender-affirming items, so things like binders, um, gaffs, that kind of thing. It's a wonderful program that will run out of funding very soon. It was funded by a couple of project grants without sustainable funding for that program. And we're trying to figure out how to make that a provincial program, but we have no funding for that. Um, and with that, you know, comes a bit of a, a counseling support piece, right? Kids don't just come in and take their thing and leave. There's discussion about how they're doing, what their needs are, and often families will come with. And um, some of that happens virtually as well. They can reach out, you know, ask questions of our sexual health center staff. And the Youth Project has a program very similar. Um, so that does exist, but these things happen kind of when there are grants. So the Prevention Innovation Fund is a good example of that because a, a few great uh, projects sprung up from that fund. I was responsible for one healthy relationships program with the youth project, and it ends when the grant ends. So, you know, there was a lot of good work around gender affirming support that kind of fell away as grants fall away. Emily Smith. It was, and I may connect with you after the meeting just to discuss in greater detail. Um, so you talked a lot about the, the partner organizations, which is great, uh, and you touched a little bit on the education system. Uh, are you the best person, part, Mr. Chair, through you to the panel, are you the best person on the, the panel to talk about the education system and the changes and the evolution that have happened in our school systems as it relates to education on, on gender identity? Mick, Mick's Hyde. I'm one person that could speak to that. I, I think possibly here, I mean, I have a lot of the kind of, I guess, secondhand, in a sense, knowledge from our sexual health center staff that go into schools and deliver education and programming, and then I hear back from them what the experiences are, um, and also having previously worked with the Youth Project and then being a partner, you know, I have the knowledge of, of that as well. Um, so I can speak to some of that, yeah. Oh, you just keep talking? <laughs> um, I, I think one of the, the, the things that we, we see a lot in our schools, like I said, is sort of time, short timed projects. So around <clears throat> gender affirming, you know, programming, healthy relationships programming for 2SLGBTQ youth. Like I said, there's been quite a bit of it. It happens in pockets when there's a grant of $5,000 and then it disappears. It's not sort of built in in a long-term way. Um, and gender identity is covered in the curriculum in Nova Scotia. However, like all sort of sexual health gender uh, topics in the curriculum, there are curriculum outcomes, and then it is up to the individual teachers, um, and you know they do what they can to meet those outcomes. But how do they meet them, and what do they cover, and how comprehensive is it, and does it really speak to the kids who are in the room, you know, in their realities? What we hear is that it's not, by and large, it's not meeting the needs, um, unfortunately, and we try to supplement that, but all of our rural centers have one staff member, and as I said, operational budget of less than 50000 a year, and are asked by schools to come in and do these quick, do 30 minutes on gender diversity. Um, and, you know, it just, it doesn't work like that. It needs to be built in. We're not funded through the Department of Education at all, by the way. So we are asked frequently, constantly, to go into schools to supplement because, and teachers are doing the right thing when they do this. <clears throat> they are asking us because they know we have the knowledge. They're recognizing a lack of training and knowledge around a topic and they're reaching out and asking for help. That's the right thing to do, but we can't meet the need with the funding that we have. We just can't. So it's, it's quite patchwork and inconsistent um, and we don't always have a great idea of how it looks across the province in different areas, um, but we hear a lot from young people that they're not getting their needs met, you know, around those topics, so. MLA Smith, you have 45 seconds. Well, I could echo my colleague from Cole Harbor Dartmouth and do a little dance for 45 seconds, or I could say thank you very much and happily move on to the next round of, of, of questioning. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you for the answers. So that, that will be the time for the PC uh, caucus. We'll have seven minutes uh, per caucus uh, in the rapid fire. That'll get us to <laughs> kind of 10.40. Um, so seven, seven minutes each. And we'll, be, we'll begin with uh, MLA Nickel. 
Well, I want to thank, um, I believe it's the NDP that put this topic on the agenda because it really, obviously from what I've been listening to, really needed to be had, especially, and hopefully that's not just a discussion that's had because this happens to be the month for sexual, you know, um, violence awareness, but, and my takeaways from this is what I, you know, in my short time as an MLA, I'm hearing service providers giving me great information on what needs to happen, but then I'm hearing from the government saying, well, we're glad that we're here because we're hearing it from the service providers. So if we didn't have this meeting, would you not be collaborating? Like that's, you know, it's, it's just a takeaway from what I'm hearing. Like I said, this is my first meeting of this committee, so it's just my, my intake. And as someone who volunteered for 20 years, being a former school advisory council chair in high school, very much worked together with the youth networks and things like that, and to hear, you know, that it's still, <laughs> it's, it's really, you know, and that particular case that you know Ms. High, Mix High re referenced about the desperation of this one person, you know, and the fact that gender equity and identity, especially in the rural areas, is still where it's at. I mean, my time at the high school level, it was you know the public health nurses are there, they're taxed with doing the yeoman's work of providing advice and support and they do a great job but at the end of the day you know they're i was in shock because some you know saying one high school was saying well we have condoms and you know we can't keep them in stock and then the other school is saying oh nobody is using the condoms because the partner prefers it without so I don't know when you're going to start having these hard conversations about how you're going to have it built in to mix Hyde's, you know, question and point because at the end of the day, and I'm looking at the business case that Ms. Painter pointed out with regards to the IUD, not, you know, the device being covered by by MSI needs to happen, and. Deputy Minister Legacy, you said you're in a review process, so can there be hope that this device would be actually available to those who want it? And economically, the business case says it's the best way forward. So, you know, it's time, it's just time to start looking at these properly. I mean, and it shouldn't matter where the person lives across Nova Scotia. So I did, those are my takeaways, and it's basically I'm asking that of the Deputy Minister. Deputy Minister Legasse? It's too, it is too early in the review to make any commitment on, on any changes that would be made at this time, but I can tell you that there's a fulsome review going on of the formulary and uh, other aspects um, of uh, coverage. Emily Nicol. Well, as someone who didn't feel that I needed to be the person to have the conversation about providing menstrual products in municipal facilities and then had it escalate at the provincial level, I, you know, it's 2022 and I've heard many times since I'm here that a fulsome review is being had. So I'm sorry if my, if my seem impatient at, you know, at this particular juncture. But you know, there's there are there's a women's choice clinic, and I'm just going to stick to my script now. At the QE2, they have a program where women who are unable to afford birth control but receive an abortion can have an IUD inserted free of charge. So, as someone mentioned, I think it was MLA LeBlanc saying that you have MSI for the person, but you know, not the device is not covered. So the funds to pay for this are through the QE2 Foundation, and last year the government made an investment in the foundation to cover the cost for up to one year. There's a need for more sustainable funding, as we've heard. So what conversations are underway and being had in that regard as part of your review? Is that to Deputy Minister Legasse? Yes, please. Deputy Minister Legasse? 
I'm not aware of any recent particular discussions about that topic, but I will ask in the department when I get back. I'm sure that there will be further discussion about that program. MLA Nickel. Could you follow up and provide me with that information, please? Thank you. I'll pass it on to my colleague. MLA de Costanzo. You have a minute and 45 seconds. I'll try and really take that ad advantage of that time to, uh, as you were speaking, I was a medical interpreter and at the refugee clinic, and I remember the wellness. Um, there was a program by the resident gynecologist who did it once a month or twice a month. That was an amazing program. So I wanted to ask if that's still there. And, the, um, and as you're saying, these gifts and all the refugees um, that I interpreted, I, I must have witnessed at least 10 um, insertions of uh, IUDs and five to six abortions. And I've, I've learned a lot about what that means to the newcomers. Most of those women had six to 10 kids and they were having these IUDs put in in hiding of not telling their husband because they don't want another kid and they're not allowed to have birth control and they're not allowed to have that. So I wanted to know, uh, is that program still going? It was fantastic and uh, is there a way that we can expand on that program? Dr. Brooks. Uh, yep, that program is still going. That was a resident initiative. So uh, we do work with the newcomer clinic and they're there once a month and they provide pap screening and uh, IUDs uh, and, or contraception, I guess, contraceptive prescriptions. One of the, the things that they do, the barriers they do um, come across in that uh, program is that um, copper IUDs, which tend to be the preference of patients they see there as opposed to the hormonal IUDs, um, are considered devices. So they're not covered by any of the drug plans. Um, so again, we try to access um, free IUDs when we can, but that's not easy. Uh, but that Order. is one of the barriers. The, 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 liberal, the liberal time uh, for second round is over. I will pass the... Um, Time on to the NDP and uh, MLA LeBlanc. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'm going to talk really fast. So the first thing I want to do is just make a quick comment on the deputy's comment about the, the access to fertility treatments. And I just want to say that it's fundamentally, I feel like that is a fundamentally flawed comment that fertility treatments will not be available to everyone because everyone needs to be able to pay up front. And that is not the case in Nova Scotia. We need to make sure that fertility treatment and surrogacy uh, you know, support is a, a, a universal, uh, um, whatever you call it, system, in, in the universal system. So um, I want to quickly ask, I want to, I want to ask about the, 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 <laughs> the term partners, because I hear this often across government. I hear the, um, the health authority and the department talk about our partners. But frankly, I don't see how that is a, again, I'm, I'm, I don't see how that is an accurate description of the relationship between sexual health, Nova Scotia, and the department, or wellness within and the department. If, if partnership was happening, then those organizations would be funded properly, and, and, and Mix Hyde would not have to run an organization on $50,000 a year and spend most of their time writing project grants for very important situations or very important projects that then, you know, as they said, end, and then it's back to the drawing board to figure out how to address the issues. To address the issues that we are experiencing in Nova Scotia in, in a systemic way, organizations need to have sustainable, um, uh, operational funding that is adequate. And so I just, I, I, I just want to get that out there. And, and, and it's befuddling to me that the Department of Education is not a partner of Sexual Health Nova Scotia. <clears throat> it really should be. So I want to ask uh, Mix Hyde, uh, Sexual Health Nova Scotia is chronically underfunded. What would be the impacts of stable, reliable, increased funding to your organization? Mix Hyde. I mean, <laughs> there's not really like a good, short way to answer that. It would be huge, right? I mean, the impact would mean, for one thing, I mean, this is the kind of 
thing that we're putting some energy towards right now is, you know, trying to make folks understand that our five centers, our five rural centers, and I can speak about Halifax and the unique challenges they face as well, being the only clinic in our network, but the five rural centers um, have one staff member each. They have an executive director who goes into schools and delivers programs, who goes into the community and gives out free safer sex supplies. During the pandemic, our ED in Cape Breton drove and their own vehicle around Cape Breton, all around Cape Breton to bring people condoms and safer sex supplies. Um, so, I mean, more staff would be a huge part of the impact, right? They each should have several staff. If you think about the women's center structure, it's actually somewhat comparable there. And having worked in a women's center, I can speak to that. So, you know, a, 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 a women's center in a small community has maybe $300,000 or more of annual funding and our sexual health center might have around 50,000. So you can imagine the difference would be more staff, staff that can do those individual pieces and then programs that they know are gonna go on all year, all the time. Our South Shore Sexual Health Center had to close for four months of the year last year because they didn't have funding to, to pay their one staff member. So they aligned it with the school year so they could be open during the school year and go into schools. Again, not funded by the Department of Education, but go into schools. And then we're closed from May to September. That will happen again without funding. That will be the case this year. It will be the case next year. Um, so being able to be open full year, have more staff members, programs that they know can continue, the Gender Affirming Gear Project that we're getting so much attention they won a national award for, and yet it will end any minute. So that would be, uh, yeah. MLA LeBlanc. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you for that answer. Um, I will just, uh, before I pass on to my, my colleague here, I will just say that, um, uh, oh, never mind, I lost my train of thought. <laughs> Emily Coombs. <laughs> I, I understand uh, my colleagues' frustrations in this because it's, it's very frustrating to hear the word partners and know that the funding is not available. And I'm going to talk some, I want to talk about the rural area, and that is with regards to access of the full, that is, reproductive sexual health care and the lack of funding in those areas where they're really needed because they're not getting the access to physicians, they're not getting the access to fertility doctors, they're not getting the access to um, abortion, they're not getting access to gender affirming care and the full on sexual health. So I would like to ask um, what needs to be done in the areas outside the HRM to give a more robust Full, on, full sexual health and reproductive health care to, to Nova Scotians. Emily Kuhn, who are we directing? I believe uh, Dr. Painter has put her hand up. Dr. Painter. I'd love to speak to this. Um, thank you for the question. Uh, one of the things that's really apparent in this discussion is that sexual and reproductive health in this province is treated as an add-on. I went to the uh, town halls, I think they were called, Ms. Oldfield hosted in four different uh, sites about health uh, last fall. Um, Kevin Oral was there, the Premier was there, and um, I raised the issue, shocker, of sexual and reproductive health and was informed that at the fourth town hall, that was the first time it had been raised. Everybody has sexual health all your life. It is absolutely basic, foundational to your well-being. The chronic underfunding is um, really, it, it causes so many population health sequelae that uh, result in all kinds of harm to our economy. Sorry, I was trained as an economist before I was a nurse. What I want to, to bring up first is how we are not using who we have. So um, Mix Hyde raised the issue of uh, physicians who aren't prescribing or uh, pharmacists who aren't inserting. Uh, we have RN prescribing in this province now. We have nurse practitioners prescribe, insert. Um, they have prescribed abortion now for four or five years, I think we're getting at. Um, why midwives can be doing all of this work. Midwives are primary care providers for reproductive health. 
They can do all this stuff. Um, so why are we not using and empowering the people we already have and who are so critical to those rural and remote um, sites in the province, right? Um, the other thing I order, wanted to... Order, Oh, sorry. No, the, it, the, the time has expired. Um, I, I was, I, I went a little bit long, just it was, you were getting to some you good points. so we're good. <laughs> <laughs> the time has expired for the NDP questions. Uh, it's now the P PC caucus questions. Um, is it uh, MLA Barkhouse? Yes. Th thank you, and uh, thank you all for coming here, and I'm rather enjoying just sitting back and, and listening to what you're all saying, and uh, the questions that are being asked. Um, of course, they tend to uh, bleed into each other, the questions, but I'm going to ask uh, some of the ones I have anyways, which is, um, uh, I think this should go to um, Deputy Minister Lagasse. Um, what steps are being taken to expand health care services in a culturally, <clears throat> culturally relevant way to improve the sexual health of Nova Scotians? Deputy Minister Lagasse? The concentration that we're doing. Uh, thank you very much for the question. So we're starting work uh, through with through the department, the NSHA and the IWK related to the preparation of a health equity framework. And so one of the we're doing quite a bit of work in that regard. And Ms. Penny and her group and in the work they're doing in reviewing the gender affirming care uh, policy uh, is our we're looking at um, how we could get out into community, right? And how we hear from people and how we could, we could develop things with community. We currently have received a proposal from um, a group in relation to gender affirming care. And we're looking at how we can engage with that group. The department's been reviewing the proposal that was put forward. And now uh, Ms. Penny and her group are looking at how they can engage uh, with that group to learn further from them as we, we develop uh, the new parts of the policy. But Ms. Penny may have something she'd like to add in that regard. Ms. Ms. Penny? Yeah, I think I would just add um, to Deputy Minister Legassi's comments. Um, it, it's exceptionally important for us to develop a policy that, that incorporates lived experience from the community that we're trying to write the policy for. So I think I would just, uh, you know, re reaffirm that through that statement. MLA Barkhouse. Okay, um, great. And this has been kind of answered, but not really, and kind of asked, but not really. So I'm going to go back to this, and I'm just wondering, um, and I think um, Ms. Ms. Hyde, or Ms. Hyde, sorry, um, or maybe Lagasse could answer this, or Oldfield maybe, um, Karen. Um, uh, can you share what work is being done to make healthcare services more welcoming and inclusive? Um, what educational opportunities are there for healthcare staff? Um, uh, to support their learning in regards to this situation. So. Make side. Yeah, I'm, <clears throat> I may not be the best person because um, I don't have I don't have much control over uh, training and education. <clears throat> so we'll pass it on. But I just want to say that um, there's been collaboration between Pride Health, um, which is a, a part-time staff of one, by the way, for the whole province. So there's been collaboration between Pride Health and a couple other nonprofits, CBRC and Halifax Sexual Health Centre, to offer training um, around um, to us LGBTQ healthcare, specifically gender affirming healthcare. These are physician training courses that are free, main pro accredited, um, and have been offered. They're virtual, really easy to take. Um, there's been a few of them developed and run now, and there's another one coming up shortly. Um, so I, that's a great initiative that hopefully will continue. Um, that is coming from, you know, sp pockets of funding as well, so I can't speak to whether it will continue, you know. But that's just one piece of, and it is, of course, uh, optional. Physicians have to decide to do it, so yeah. But they have been, they've been well taken. There's been a lot of people at them, yeah. Ms. Oldfield or Deputy Minister, is there any? Uh, Ms. Oldfield. I wouldn't really have too much to add other than to echo the comments around Pride Health and and I and you know I've I've met at least one individual involved in that uh, during our Speak Up for Healthcare tour and uh, as has been noted uh, for most of the morning. One person can only do so much, and so it is important to determine the ways that we can help and support and, and get the, the education and the important parts out across the system and across the province. MLA Barkhouse. Um, okay, uh, actually, um, 
uh, Dr. Hatchett, uh, what efforts are planned or are underway to increase public awareness in education around uh, STIs? Dr. Hatchett? Um, other than the sort of programs that have been already talked about, uh, I'm not sure that there are any particular public awareness uh, issues. I think, if I may, one of the biggest challenges, we don't have an STBBI program to oversee um, what the goals of care are, what the um, uh, initiative should be, because, um, you know, PHAC does have the, an STBBI plan, um, and you know, without having a program to sort of oversee it properly is going to be hard to achieve that with piecemeal funding and piecemeal um, integration. MLA Barkos. Uh, uh, th thank you. I'm sorry. I was writing that down. I was writing some of this stuff down as we go. So it's, um, I, I'm done. But just thank you. And thank you for all your questions or answers here today. And it actually has me thinking more questions that I might reach out to some of you and, and uh, find out. Thank you. MLA Palmer. MLA Palmer. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And uh, just want to uh, go back. There's no doubt that the uh, fertility uh, rebate is going to help many hundreds of Nova Scotians, as been referenced by the deputy. And uh, and we've talked about the, the how it's uh, including surrogacy. And uh, just to expand on that, could you please talk to us about how that's going to help inclusive families and how that's going to really uh, be a positive uh, in that end of things? And I'll address that to anybody on the panel. Miss Penny, or, or so I think I think your question is 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 uh, around the fertility rebate and 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 its inclusiveness, yes. um, and so I think that that's the most exciting piece of the rebate is is that it is inclusive and it is not uh, necessarily just for heterosexual couples. Yeah, yeah, I agree. And was there Emily Palmer? Are you you're finished? All right, so we had we have 15 seconds left, um, but but at this point, we'll we'll end with the question uh, and answer, and uh, we'll move on to closing remarks. So, if if um, anyone is open for closing remarks, I'll I'll look to our witnesses, Miss Ofield. Thank you. I really appreciate the time today, and I particularly appreciate um, you know the questions and and the answers. I've appreciated meeting. The, the folks here at the witness table. I've made a lot of notes. Um, I, I just want to sort of summarize my takeaways because I think they are important. Um, Ms. Painter made a point towards the end uh, that everyone has sexual health your whole life. And uh, that's something I'm going to take away from this uh, session today and go forward as, uh, as we move to make decisions and inform ourselves as to parts of the system that need further attention, deeper attention, uh, stronger partnerships. I've made a note that, uh, you know, Department of Community Service was referenced. Um, they are a partner, but they're not here today. The Department of Education, very important component, and they're not here today. Um, we do need to find ways to resource support across the province. That is another really important note. We have a number of rural MLAs present. You know, there's so many more things that can be done. But the good news here um, is that, you know, the issues are being talked about. They're on the table. We have an opportunity to, to walk forward and to learn and to do the things that are right for the people of our province. So thank you for, for that opportunity to learn today. Any other witnesses have closing remarks? Ms. Painter? Um, I, I want to close by really um, emphasizing how this province has made, I've been, I've been doing abortion work for 20 years, and what this province achieved in 2018 was really extraordinary, world class. We have the best access to abortion in the world. You can get it from any primary care prescriber. It is completely decriminalized. Um, we have a very, very, very big country, though, and so that's the issue, right? Um, this transportation issue. But aside from that, we can't do anything about that. Um, so really, when I look at this, and I'm very interested in efficiencies and achievable gains and places where we can lead and do really well, 
I see universal access to contraception as, as filling so many needs. Okay, so um, Mix Hyde raised all of these issues about gender affirming care, um, and contraception is gender affirming care. You get an IUD, you're not going to have a period for five years. That feels really good if that's the kind of gender affirming care that you're looking for, okay? Um, universal access, it helps all the youth who don't have to disclose to their parents and go through private insurance. They just get the care they need, um, right? Like, you can't drive to Halifax if you're 13 years old, okay? Um, it addresses this issue about this, this month dedicated to um, understanding and highlighting the issues with sexual assault and intimate partner violence. Contraception prevents that. It prevents poverty. It prevents low educational outcomes. It prevents unemployment. It is the best win-win we could possibly imagine. And it's definable and achievable. And so I, I want to leave again by um, really wishing us well on a path forward where we can get that done and again lead nationally and internationally in the way we care for the people of this province. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Painter. Uh, Mick Hyde? Um, yeah, I, I want to speak, I guess, generally in these closing remarks to, to sexual health services and access um, because uh, <laughs> Dr. Painter said everything I wanted to say about access to birth control, so that's done. Um, thank you so much for, for having, having all of us here today. Um, in terms of that general access to, to sexual health services, um, when I think about uh, when I think about that and I think about being underfunded in the way we've talked about today, what comes to mind right away for me is that um, the federal budget had, you know, what, a few million dollars allocated to sexual uh, gender and reproductive health services, which we were like jumping up and down with our federal affiliate Action Canada to see that in there. Um, to my knowledge, and I could be corrected on this for sure, um, none of it made it to Atlantic Canada or at least not Nova Scotia. We, ha we applied we were rejected. Um, we applied with our partners, Pride Health, um, CBRC, the AIDS Coalition, the Nova Scotia Advisory Commission on AIDS. We put in a joint application. Um, nope. So then came our provincial budget, which we were like, <laughs> maybe there'll be something in here for us. And it, it didn't feel like that, that there was. There was a few things that we thought that could stretch to include us in this way or that way, but not, not really. Um, so we've, we've kind of been feeling a little bit a little bit disappointed, a little bit let down um, lately by budgets. Um, and I just also wanna, I guess, uh, try to clarify our funding structure a little bit. So we have an annual grant application with the Department of Health and Wellness. So I apply for it every year. Um, the application's pretty much the same, but it's never guaranteed. You know, any year we could not get it. Um, that hasn't happened, thankfully. But we also haven't had an increase of more than $16,000 in 20 years. Um, some of our staff at the sexual health centers are making less than they were making when they were hired six years ago, um, for example. Um, so, you know, we really need an increase to our operational funding. We also need it to be guaranteed that it's not about to disappear. Um, it's extremely stressful, as you can imagine. I need a vacation about this time every year after I fill out the 30-page application and just, like, do this for the next two weeks <laughs> or however long. Um, and, and we feel like we've, we've actually built a pretty good relationship with um, the folks who work with us on that grant. But the, the system pieces don't change, so it's not really about the, the human relationship. Um, and, and we should have funding from the Department of Community Services we should have funding from the Department of Education, from the status of women. Um, these are questions that I don't, I don't really have answers to, but I would, I would like to explore more with anyone who's willing to look at that. Um, and I also just wanted to, to mention about sort of policies and strategies specific to sexual health and gender affirming care and comprehensive education. It's really important that we have these things in place, that they're written down. The policy that was referenced on gender affirming care was created by a couple of volunteers who felt passionately about kind of the, the challenging system of gender affirming care in the province right now. 
That policy, oh my gosh, if you haven't read it, go read it right after this meeting. It is amazing and wonderful and comprehensive. I can't believe what these student volunteers did with this work. Um, so there are people with the knowledge just out there in our community, going to school, living their lives. There are trans and gender diverse people. There, obviously, everybody has sexual health. So there are lots of folks who have a lot of knowledge on this stuff and can help create strategies and policies that you know will really support us. And those things are what we can look to then when we're we're looking for funding. We can say, well, it's here, we need to do it, you know? Um, so I just wanted to kind of restate the importance of that. And, and lastly, just say about partnership, um, I, I, I do take everybody's points on the, what does partnership mean in a sense? Um, and just know that at least for Sexual Health Nova Scotia, we want to be partners with as many, you know, government, nonprofit, community, everybody. Um, we're, we're, we love partnership. It's, I think, one of the things we do best, so come and partner with us. Thanks. <laughs> Thanks, Nick Hyde. Um, Dr. Brooks or Deputy Minister? All right. Well, that concludes our uh, topic for today. And I'd really like to thank the witnesses on behalf of the committee for, for coming here today. Um, lots of insight, lots of information, um, lots to look at. Um, at this point, I'll, I'll let um, the witnesses leave. I would like to take a short three-minute break. Um, and we'll come right back just while they're while they're leaving, and then we'll get back into committee uh, business.
Are they ready? Yep. Order. Uh, we're going to get back into committee business. Uh, we have a number of items to discuss uh, with respect to committee business today. The first, first two items are correspondence. So correspondence from the Minister of Seniors and Long-Term Care restaffing calculations. This was a response to a letter sent by the committee after our meeting of February 8th. So you were all uh, forwarded that correspondence. If that's okay, we can move on. Um, second item was correspondence from the Office of Healthcare Professionals, recruitment restaffing vacancies. It was a response to requests for information made at the meeting of March 8th. Um, so we were forwarded this correspondence on March 29th and again yesterday. That's fine. The, the next item is date of May meeting on government initiatives of ambulance availability and offload delays and DHW response. So, so this is one of the last couple of committee um, topics left. None of the witnesses for the other topics can appear on May 10th, which is our typical day. Um, so there's an opportunity to have that um, um, topic on Thursday, May the 12th in the morning or Tuesday, May 17th, either in the morning or the afternoon. Um, Mr. MLA Smith. If, Mr. MLA thank Smith. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Mr. MLA Chair, if there's an option to uh, to provide feedback on this, my two cents would be on the 17th. Please and thank you, Mr. Chair. On the Chair. 17th? Uh, MLA Di Costanzo? That would have been my suggestion as well, so I'm glad it, it works. Uh, MLA Palmer. Mr. Chair, I, I agree with the date. We just uh, do note that the Veterans Affairs does meet that day, and we just have to make sure that we, we're not on the 17th. Oh, um, Ms. Cavanaugh. The Veterans Affairs Committee normally does meet on, what is that, the third Tuesday of the month, but in May, that particular meeting's been rescheduled. I think it's going to be on another date. It was changed. You're correct. Thank you, Judy. Oh, so, so I guess for the committee, would we prefer the, the afternoon as is normal for health, or would we prefer the morning? Morning? Afternoon? Afternoon's fine. Okay, so if there's consensus for the 17th in the afternoon, that would be okay. So we... <laughs> I'm looking at you, no. Uh, so yeah, so, so I, I get consensus, so the meeting will be moved from the 10th of May to the 17th of May, uh, at our regularly scheduled time. Perfect. Um, we do have a meeting confirmed for June 14th. Um, Deputy Minister Legasse and Dr. Strang will appear for the vaccine booster shots. Um, the, the other topic, uh, the next one was we had as a committee agreed to have a seventh uh, topic in our six month period. That was with the cardiac arrest outcomes. I think it was um, heart and stroke had, had uh, reached out to us. And so we wanted to do it in the six month period. Uh, there were two, um, the committee instructed the clerk to arrange a special uh, meeting. The witnesses would be available on May 31st or June 21st. Um, the clerk suggests any of the times noted here, whether it's two to four on the 31st or nine to 11 or 10 to noon on the 21st. Just some brief discussion about, about this. Um, we do know that June 21st is getting close to graduations and, and that sort of, sort of um, thing, but I see um, MLA Barkhouse has her hand up as well. I just want to state that May 31st would be the best, um, I think, for, for most here. So, so how does everybody, um, MLA LeBlanc? Yep, May 31st makes sense to me. Happy. From either uh, I guess two to four is two the to time four is the have. is the time we have. So if if there's consensus from the committee for that, we can we can we can take that. The last item on the committee business is the agenda setting. So June fourteenth will conclude our um, current list of agenda topics. Emily Smith. Sorry to interrupt, Mr. Chair. Can I request a, a five minute extension to the meeting time just to make sure we get through this? Is that is that okay with everybody? A five minute. Extension? Okay, so we have consensus um, with 40 seconds left for a five minute extension. Um, so do we wanna hold a com uh, the committee to hold the agenda setting meeting at the end of a meeting, like a 10 minute rush job, or do we wanna hold a separate agenda meeting in July um, to go over the topics for the next six? MLA Smith. There's nothing I'd love more than a full on meeting in July to sort out the topics for our next round. 
So does July? I may be gone away, but have a couple conferences in July, not vacation conferences. So July 12th would be what we would would be our typical meeting time in the middle of in the middle of summer. It's our second week in in July. So if everybody is okay with that, um, we could we could have our July 12th meeting as our agenda setting meeting, and that gives um, caucuses time to to come up with with um, topics as well. All right, that covers all the business I had. That was. Very well done. Is there any other further business? Hearing none, um, our next meeting will be scheduled for Tuesday, May 17th at 1, 1, one, at one till 3. Um, and our, our witnesses will be, the topic will be Department of Health and Wellness um, Government Initiatives of Ambulance Availability and Offload Delays and DHW Response. Oh, sorry, and IUOE Local 727. Mm -hmm. My apologies. So that, if that's okay, I guess the uh, meeting is adjourned. Thank you. Well done. Well done, team.